<laughs> Welcome to another episode of Zero Ales and Hockey Tales with Wally. And today, I'm so excited to have on a 29-year-old from Hammond, Ontario, Canada. His hockey journey has taken him to Canada, the USA, Czechia, Austria, Slovakia, and Denmark. A staple with the Cumberland grads that took him 10th overall mucked around with Clarkson University before turning pro and heading straight to the AHL, bounced between the A and the coast for a few years, and looks like he pretty near won it with the Toledo Walleye and is an ECHL All-Star. He then packed his shit for Europe and spread his hockey wings with Orly Janajmo of the Ebel. He's <laughs> mucked it up in the Ice Hockey League, the Slovak League, and the Czech top league whatever that one's called and he is now running a mock of the danish league with the first place blue foxes of herding and if i was a betting man we'll have a gold helmet like yours truly in a few short months welcome to the shed kevin tansy <laughs> thank you so much for having me brent excited to be here yeah i get into how we know each other nice to meet you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely through uh the truth Caruth, mac Mac, the truth, Caruth. And uh, just so you know, that's what you guys are playing for this year, right there on the shelf behind me. That's a gold helmet oh, from Denmark. Oh, yeah, there she is. That's yeah, yeah. Genius. Won that with Sunder Yuski. <laughs> yeah, we're playing them. Uh, we're playing them tomorrow and Saturday. Oh, yeah. Where? Battle. Uh, we got a home and home Friday and Saturday night. It's uh, the battle for first place. We're three points right? ahead of right now. And so uh big could be a big swing weekend here. Yeah. Well, folks, don't forget your Twix, right? Oh, there you go. <laughs> so that is obviously Mac the Truth Caruth is what you're calling him. Uh Shed Boost, but he is he's doing pretty good this year, eh? <laughs> yeah, he's uh just off uh, another shutout. Uh last game we won five nothing. I think that's like his sixth, maybe seventh <laughs> shutout right now. He had like four. That's a row. lot of shutouts, eh? Like six is about kind of max for a season, usually, no. Yeah, well, especially over here, we only play 48 games. So, I mean, he's uh, his numbers have been wild this year. He's uh, he's, really, he's the anchor of our team for sure. Um, he's, What's uh, it like but, in practice with him? Is he a bit competitive? I hear he's a bit competitive. I, <laughs> yeah, Mac, uh, he is competitive for sure. He he doesn't like to let goals in or, like, even lose on, like, a, a two-on-two, like, drill game. He gets rattled if uh, – if he something happens, goals. it's pretty funny. It's uh best it's, goalies I ever played with got really mad when they got scored on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You don't like to lose. So that's uh, mm -hmm. definitely good to have. And um, I guess how we know each other is you reached out on Insta, my honey hole there uh, where I put most of the shed stuff. And uh, you mentioned you started a CBD company, eh? I sure did. Impactive CBD is what I started. Uh, our uh, goal is to reduce the use of painkillers and opioids in sports. Just and I can't, I can't uh, support you more than like I totally agree with you. When I was in Germany, man, they gave us painkillers like they were candy. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty wild. Some of the leagues, uh, you know, back in my experience is more North America, but it's it's wild how easily accessible they are, and it's uh, not it's not great. No, and like cbd right like you obviously started this company so you must know how it's made right but it's a plant that grows out of the ground right maybe it's like meant to be used right <laughs> yeah exactly i mean it's uh it's all natural everything in our in our products are all 100 percent organic and you know it's it just really works for any bumps or bruises or muscle strains and any real injuries that you might have that come up through anything really, but especially in sports where, you know, you're working hard, you're in full contact, you're, you're running, get hurt. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're getting hurt. Um, myself personally, I've broken about a dozen bones. I've had two surgeries, have dislocated both of my shoulders for a combination of like 20 ish times. Sorry, um, what was that? You dislocated? My shoulders. They just yeah. don't stay in yeah. the socket. Yeah, no, they just like to to you know fall out every now and then. You gotta, uh, you, I've seen guys do that. They gotta pop it back in, right? And it's painful shit. Yeah. yeah, I've had to pop it back in more than a few times. I had this one dislocated uh a 17 times after um after a pretty unfortunate event. And it was just one of those things where I would reach for something, it would just pop out for a few weeks. It was oh god. Nuts. Yeah, had to had to learn how to put them back in, which is uh never never a fun. So how are they doing now? How is your health now? It's fine now. So I had surgery on my right shoulder about 10 years ago. 
And that's when you're in university, you miss a whole year, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, in a, a pretty unfortunate situation where I was jumped, um, downtown Ottawa with a blunt object of some sort. I don't remember it. Um, cause it was like three weeks of my life. I got messed up pretty good. I had uh, skull cracked. My brain was bleeding. Um, I had three ribs broken. I had my shoulder messed up, which resulted in all those dislocations and I need to get surgery eventually. And these guys uh, jumped you downtown Ottawa, like out of nowhere. I, so I don't know exactly, but, um, yeah, it was like, I was staying at my buddy's place because at the time I was 19, I was still living with my parents and I was working at a hockey school, uh, which was about 45 minutes away from my parents' place. So I stayed at a buddy's place who lived in Vanier, which is in Ottawa. It's kind of like, it's not right downtown Ottawa, but it's in the city and it's sort of like that area of, you know, I mean, it's Canada. So rough areas in Ottawa, there aren't really that many, I guess, but but it's about um, as rough as it gets type thing. Exactly. And it's all, it kind of borders on the side with where cheap student housing is. So my buddy was living there and stayed at his place for the night and we were playing call of duty and there's three of us, two remotes, you know, the rule we're kill death ratio. You're sitting out for a round and yeah. I'm not very good at call of duty. So yeah, yeah. Um, I was pretty much every other time. And you know, the one time I, I said, all right, I'm going to go get my bag and uh went outside to my car and that's pretty much the last thing i remember but they seriously found yeah they found me outside out cold called the ambulance um i was in the i was in a coma for just under two days and i was um i don't have a sense of smell still to this day from it pretty wild and uh yeah i was in the hospital for about a month lost something like 80 pounds and uh, so you're pretty well almost you're almost dead then yeah, no, yeah, there was, uh, there was, you know, there was a, about a 12 to 24 hour period where they really didn't know if I was going to pull through kind of thing, because it was a pretty, pretty serious brain injury. And, uh, you know, for three weeks um, afterwards, I would wake up and with crazy head injuries, you never know what's going to happen. And I would wake up and I would think that I was going to school one day, I'd grab a piece of paper and just be like, I'm going to class walking down the hallway in the hospital. Another day, I'd be like, Oh, yeah, like, my buddies from Toronto came to visit me and just like making up stories and really wasn't myself. And then one morning I just woke up and it was kind of back to, to me again. It was sort of scary uh, shit, man. Yeah, man. Head injury is no joke. I was uh, pretty fortunate to come out with basically unscathed from it. I mean, even that, like you're playing professional hockey. Yeah, man. I mean, (laughs) he's doing, uh, doing my best, tried to uh, get the recovery gone. Took me a full season to recover from it. Um, and more because of, you know, the extra stra- stuff that came along with it, like the the just being scared, being traumatized, having someone out there that jumped me that I don't know who it was. Um, or why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or why. That kind of stuff kind of haunted me for a while. Um, had to learn how to let go of that for sure. And uh, fortunate to be where I am today with the health that I have. I can't imagine. Um well, so then how do you start a CBD company? Because so my tale is um, when I got back from Germany, I vowed I would not take any more painkillers, you know, and it's really all I could think about was how much pain I was in. Um, and the doctors asked what I took when I went to see them about it for stuff in germany and canada didn't really know about it and they're like what do you take for this like you need to take something and i'm like well i ain't taking painkillers back off (laughs) you know and uh so they did prescribe me cbd uh before it was like legal in canada like it is now um and it changed my life um i could think about other things than how much my knee hurt i hear you man i hear you so so loud and clear it was uh for me, it was, you know, I was in a, a pretty dark place after the injury and being assaulted. I, I, you know, I was my whole life since I was four years old, I wanted to be a hockey player and, you know, yeah. I trained towards it. I worked towards it. it. takes a ton of sacrifice and determination to work. Your and way and that you don't even know why. And then all of a sudden someone pretty well takes that from you. That's wild yeah. shit. Exactly. And so after all the injuries happened, you know, obviously a super 
big brain injury like that. Um, after that happened, it was kind of like, I don't know if I'll be able to play again. Has this been ripped away? First of all, I didn't know if I was going to ever be myself again. Yeah. Second of all, am I ever going to be able to step on the ice again? And um, so for me, my issue was that I, I grew a little bit of a dependency on painkillers as well. Um, at first, you know, I took them and I, I didn't really like the fog that it was giving me and tried to stay away from them. And then, I found it. I found it messed up my gut, you know? Yeah, for me, it wasn't wasn't so much my gut. I have a pretty, pretty iron stomach. Um, like I, I can basically stomach most things. But it was for me, it was it just kind of just gave me a fog mentally. And I was just kind of there Not sharp yeah disassociative just kind of like uh, all the time and um so when i started visiting doctors to see if they would like if i could get cleared to play hockey again the first one that i saw who i mean he wasn't he wasn't a sports doctor at all he was just you know a, a, a doctor and he told me that it was you know against his against his decision that i returned to play because of you know the significant brain damage that i had had and doctors that, that aren't doctors that aren't hockey doctors don't get us though do they <laughs> it, yeah it was that was definitely something i was struggling with um i and after that you know i i, I remembered what how the painkillers made me feel and i was just my like anxiety my world was collapsing around me and i remembered that you know these pills or they were a way to escape um a way to kind of shelf what I was dealing with. And, you know, I didn't have the emotional capacity at the time to really deal with it or understand it or really know what the hell was going on, to be honest with you. So I, I just wanted to find an escape. And with that, I, uh, I started using the painkillers in ways that are not supposed to be used. I wasn't necessarily in pain too much, but I would still take them on nights where, you know, I wasn't, wasn't feeling myself and then you know you, for you, so you'd take of, them to feel better not even if it was about pain it wasn't even really feeling better it was like feeling nothing mm -hmm. you know because i would i would take it to just what kind of painkillers are we talking because i'm i'm the stuff i i was taking to germany wasn't like strong shit it was just the normal shit right like it wasn't yeah, something i was I, really addicted to it's just i needed it to play yeah and like i i struggle with the word addicted to as well um, because it wasn't like I was waking up and being like, okay, I need, I need oxy. I need this. But what I, when I, I got prescribed oxy because of the pain and that was kind of like my first introduction to anything like besides, besides that, you know, I had just smoked weed before and, you know, had alcohol. And that was my first introduction to kind of like the numbing side of, of medication. And I, you know, I started taking it while I was drinking just to kind of like get a fog and not really just kind of be in my like own space and not zoned just, out. Yeah, exactly. Like, cause that's what I wanted because, you know, for the first, I mean, damn, for the first two years, it was, it, I, it was me retelling the story again and again and again. And it was just like, I was reliving the nightmare and I, it was just a lot to deal with. So I turned to those and, you know, after about two or three years, I, I just kind of realized that, all right, like this is, it's not sustainable. Um, it's not, it's not a right way to live. I was noticing, you know, my, my relationship with, you know, my family and friends was just kind of like, just nothing was really happening. You know, I was, I was becoming short tempered. I would, I had no patience a lot and, um, I really had to do some inner work all at the same time while not really telling anybody, because again, at the time I didn't, while I was taking them, I didn't really see it as a problem because it was just a way for me to escape. And I was like, all right, I'm dealing with it. And then, you know, once I kind of became a little bit more educated, I was like, all right, this is, this is not great. Um, I can't just keep going down this path. You know, books started coming out about guys who played in the national league and other sports that got addicted to different kinds of things because they were, you know, getting away the pain, getting away the mental issues. And, um, so I, I, you know, worked really hard and I, I basically made a pact with myself saying that, you know, I'll stay away from them too, just like you did. And um, my first year pro came and two things happened. So you were doing all that while you're playing at Clark's and then like, you're taking it, you're taking quite a few painkillers throughout your university career. 
Yeah, I mean, I, like even even quite a few is. I think I was a lucky person where I didn't get like too dependent on them, but it was like one of those things where if it was offered to me, I'd be like, hell yeah. Like, right. Like let's, let's take it. Like I'm a little sore. I'm dealing with some, some shit. Like, let me, let me take it. Um, and then, you know, I'd do it socially. I would do it like, drinking and stuff like that. Um, and you know, it's a vulnerable spot to be in talking about all this. And it's, it's just a, a weird, a weird concoction of emotions because you know, I, I you have your, your, persona who you try to be as as an athlete and you know i i put on a, an image that you know i I'm, I'm a tough guy i you know i can i can take it whatever but your actual self and what you've gone through is sometimes different than what you want the public eye to see and for me like the mixing of the two now is just like you know it's 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 a vulnerable spot and so anyways my first year pro is when i was one introduced to cbd and two it was my first year pro and I really saw how accessible some of these, these painkillers were to guys, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I just thought that at the same time, it was like, well, there's like, there's nothing really natural to recover from besides like a bag of ice. And, you know, the science was coming out. I was, I was using CBD more and loving it. And then mm -hmm. once I moved out of North America and went to Znoimo in Czech, my first year in Europe, it was, um, you know, I, I, I dislocated my shoulder there at the end of the year and they needed a D man for playoffs and I was done for the year. So they bought me out. So I was sitting on 15 K and messaged my buddy who had a CBD company before. And I said, Hey, like, let's, uh, let's attack the, like, if, if you want, let's, let's start a new company and let's attack this a little differently. And impactive CBD was born. And it's, you know, the mission behind it was basically like, let's give athletes a healthy option to recover because it's, it's not really, it's not really there in sports at the moment, you know, there's and, some, and, and it's natural and yep. it works yep. and it doesn't make you high folks. Right. It's exactly. it takes yep. away pain. <laughs> yeah. And that was the thing, right. I Does was that make for... sense folks? Anybody listening? I think it makes sense to me. <laughs> Just think it out loud yeah. in the shed again. <laughs> And, you know, I was, I was looking for something to deal with the pain without having that fog because, you know, I, I wasn't obviously going through the pain that I was going through from the assault, but I was still blocking shots. Um, you know, I was the physical guy in college, lots of hits, lots of block shots and, you know, just something to deal with the pain and in, in pro without having, you know, that kind of slippery slope that I kind of fell yeah. victim to yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, is, was key for me. So I, we we started impactive and that's oh, I'm not very proud of you for getting that started because like for me when I was learning a new industry new job and like I had to use my brain right I'm sitting at a computer and I'm doing that stuff and like I literally would sit there and think about my knee and how much it hurt and like oh shit it's gonna pop again oh shit it's gonna pop again and that's literally taking up most of my mental capacity the day they prescribed CBD to me changed everything um i could think about work i could think about other things it's awesome man I, I love that and like that's that's the same thing for for us right like there's a lot of mental stress that goes along with being even a minor pro athlete and just it like is a stressful job like it's oh, yeah. stressful shit man every game is so like the fans the organizations like your coaching staff like every game if you make a mistake man it it's people give it like they get upset <laughs> yeah. yeah and if you have a whole bad year then you might be done your job you might be looking for oh, it's like i just was the research team got hot and i just saw one of my shed guys just got released and it like makes my heart break you know it's crazy man it's 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 a tough industry there's a lot of a lot of good hockey players, a lot of good athletes out there. So you, you want to be feeling at your best and you want to be ready to go whenever you can. And yeah, um, so that we ridiculous. should uh, we got a lot of other shit to talk about, but we got to <laughs> keep going with this. It's impactive. So is it mainly website sales? Yeah, so we are getting into retail stores. We we started about three years ago and then um, a year ago we were acquired. And we, we are acquired by a bigger company and we relaunched in September. So we're kind of creeping into retail stores at the moment, um, but mostly online. That's impactivecbd.com. 
and activecbd.com uh, folks and guess what <laughs> starting the 29th of november for seven days folks if you put in the code shed boost <laughs> you get 15 percent off right <laughs> yes sir absolutely happy to be uh on here in chat so wanted to shed to give boost the one word folks how fun is that right 15 percent <laughs> off <laughs> shed boost <laughs> i'm serious though so the 29th of november till colby's birthday the 5th of december at midnight will be done but you guys mainly because i asked for some samples i wanted to try the shit out right but um you're not doing much in canada right now right so most of my listeners are in the uk they can get it right they sure can they sure can get it yeah we're not doing it in canada we're doing us and europe because canada the, the laws are just a little bit too strict right now so we're waiting until those die down and it becomes more of a like just a mainstream product and you can get it at a sport check or a shopper's drug mart type thing and um, that's y- yours yours is not like um i guess like there's different ways of taking cbd right yours looked yeah. almost like a deodorant stick from what i saw yeah. so here it is i don't know if you have camera on the actual pod, yeah but- it'll be on youtube not as many people watch the youtube as the audio right. but so it Check does, it, it looks like a stick, like you could, like a deodorant yeah. stick, right? It's like, a, it's like a deodorant stick, same thing. A little so that you just rub that on where it hurts. So I would rub that on my knee. Hell yeah, man. You just like go and you put it on like, oh, I'm sore here. Do that. And like, that's the crazy thing is that's like, that's how much you need. Um, and folks, it doesn't even look like that's made into pill form in a factory, <laughs> you know? No, it's, uh, it's, it's, you don't have to ingest it. Then you just rub it on your skin. Yeah. Yeah. So it's for like, uh, acute problems, like targeted areas where you're sore, you know, your hamstring, your ankle sore, throw that on. And so how um, much do one of those go for? Those go for 25 bucks American. And that last you a while, eh? Cause you didn't have to rub on much there. Yeah, no. So the, I, I would say, and like, I, I use this pretty much every day um and one stick lasts me about a month so like an average an average person who might not be as active as i am or bl- jumping in front of slap shots or body checking people or dealing with matt caruth chasing me after practice because i scored on him uh, <laughs> um so yeah i mean the average person it, it lasts from probably one month to three months i'd say and that's only 25 bucks American folks shed boost shed boost. It's only like 20 bucks, right? <laughs> cool stuff. So that's, that's fun. And fun is fun folks. So somebody please buy some, some sticks. So I actually <laughs> feel like I helped this guy sell some stuff, right? <laughs> Don't embarrass me fans. <laughs> buy a stick shed boost. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So where and what are you doing now? I am, <laughs> I am in Hernan, Denmark. Uh, I'm in my seventh year pro right now, playing with the Blue Fox. And I'm right now, I'm sitting in my house chatting with you. Uh, we're in first place right now. Got a big weekend coming up. So it looks like a nice place they gave you. It's a, it's a nice spot. It's a, it's, I'm on a lake back here. It's like, Shut it's such a uh, filthy mouth. You're on a lake too. Yeah, it's 5 30 at night here, so it can't really see. Dark, I'm just but... thinking out loud, you guys might beat Sooner Yuski this weekend because there's probably guys still living on Clover Vine. They don't have lakes behind their places. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we got the better swag. So <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, happy hockey players play better. Um, so you guys yeah. are having fun, eh? Yeah, man. I mean, it's always fun winning. You've you've been there before whenever winning is fun. You know, losing season is is terrible, and being on a winning season, winning is fun. It is fun. And um, how also how we know each other, though, is speaking of Mac, I saw a video of your arena this season and man, it made my heart want to explode because the Twix thing all started with this, right? Like in here with Mac and man, that was a lot of Twix that one night, eh? <laughs> I think I think it was I don't know the exact number, but it was over a thousand. Um, well, the ref <laughs> caught it in midair. The other team, I saw that punk that lost the game pick one up. But yeah, your guys' win up. song is awesome, man. That song they played at the end when the, with during that video, I was so jacked up. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a pretty cool atmosphere there it's, for sure. It's a it's a smaller. I mean, the rinks in Denmark are typically a little bit smaller than North America. We have, I think, we seat like three thousand, and we get pretty much like twenty five hundred at least. Well, I, it's a new barn from the one I played in. I was playing a different one when I was in Denmark. Okay, right on. Yeah, I'm not sure how long it's been here, but it's, uh, it's definitely a nice game. 
Well, it sure looked like the fans were having fun. Um, so keep that up, folks. Don't forget your Twix this weekend, right? And sorry for beating you in game seven way back when, but it's a nice helmet. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so poster picks. You played against Yarmer Yager. That's cool. I did. Yeah, that was that. I mean, I don't. There's not. There's probably only one other time where I've come and been like shaking before. Not like shaking, but just being like, "Holy crap!" Like this is. A cool I can't experience. believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My first like NHL exhibition game, but playing against Yager was like that was last year, and it was his fiftieth birthday too. Um really and, yeah it was just, we were playing against him on his 50th birthday and there was like That's a big cell crazy 50 years old playing pro man i only made it to 32 and i broke <laughs> nuts man seeing him on the ice is, is is awesome it's really funny too i mean i was in the czech extra league which is like the top league in czech it's very good league very good league yeah yeah like david Krejci was in that league last year played against him thomas placanets was on yager's team and then there's it's basically where like Czech guys who play, you know, lots of games in the NHL, they'll go back and play like one or two years in their hometown at the end of the, their career. Well, and they definitely and, should, right? They get to go home and play at home and they even get to make money, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh man, you, you should have seen Yager was treated like a, like, I mean, he is a God over there, but he was treated like a God over there on the ice. Like he would play like maybe five to seven minutes a game. Not much. We played him twice. And in those times, like when he had the puck, you like you could tell he still had it obviously when he didn't have a puck he was a little slow but it was it was hilarious because we'd we'd go on like a fast break and he'd be on the ice and there'd be a guy that's joining the rush that's beating him up the ice and he would literally just turn and like bear hug them for like one and a half to two seconds and like the most obvious penalty you would see but they wouldn't call it because it's like yager because it's yager and you're just kind of like all right well this at least that we know what we're up against. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. So it was uh, it was pretty funny to see some of that stuff, but it was cool. I scored a scored a goal on his birthday and ended up getting player of the game there too with uh, Thomas Placanitz. So that was a pretty cool moment for my career. That is cool, man. Because Yager is like he's a legend, legend. Like there's not there's no one else like him, man. Playing at fifty, still playing pro, and like what he did in the NHL and for how long he did it, man. What a guy. Just a, a dandy, I hear too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know him personally, but um, definitely an interesting human to be able to, to do that for that long. Like, no shit. Um, okay, better move on though. Um, one of your poster picks is you squaring up for a fight with the Columbus Blue Jackets farm team, which, yeah, that's what I don't know who Columbus is even with nowadays. Who are you fighting uh-huh. there? I'm fighting Alex Gallant there, who's uh, way... How did it go? <laughs> not great. <laughs> I had lots of... I had a few fights that did not go well, but I'm not a fighter, so... <laughs> yeah, it was one of those things. It was... Uh, it was That was like... I played 10 or 12 games with Binghamton for the PTO after college, and then I started with Chicago, and that was like my fifth or seventh game of the season, like pretty early. And you're trying to show them what you'll do for the boys, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm new and I'm, I'm ready to go. And um, we have a player getting jumped in the corner. We were playing in, um, in Cleveland and uh, <laughs> there's a uh, Alex Galant who by a big mistake of my own, I did not know who he was. I should have. Right. He is pound for pound. One of the toughest players out there. Um, he's, you know, he's something like over 250 career fights or something like that. Like he was on that enforcer movie on Netflix that they released. Okay. Um, And so our, one of our better players is getting jumped in the corner and this I'm like rushing in to go in. And this guy like stops me at the, at the blue line. And he's like, he's like, you want to go? And I look, I'm six, four. Yeah. And like five, 10, five, 11. And I just look at him. I'm like, hell yeah, I want to go. Like, this This is awesome. Like, sure, let's go. He proceeds to drop his gloves and turn his back to me and, like, just kind of, like, give the fans, like, one of these. And then you knew you were really in one. <laughs> I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> if he's doing that with that type of confidence, you know you're in one, eh? Yeah. <laughs> That's when you're like, oh, shoot, what'd I do? <laughs> yeah, like an eight to ten seconds square off where, like, he's doing like all these things and I'm just kind of like, Oh God. <laughs> like I'm just, I'm just there. Like I'm just a big willing guy and he grabs me. And the first 
two punches he gives me are straight in the stomach. And I'm like, I, my that would first, be unusual. You, I wouldn't be prepared for that, would you? I haven't fought. I haven't fought in this point. I I got basically had one like scrum fight that was not even really a fight in Binghamton. But before that, like you don't fight in college. No, you don't. My last fight that I was in that before that, I got knocked out and skull cracked. It wasn't really a fight. But um, other than that, my fights were in juniors. So I hadn't fought since I was 18 years old. And this guy goes and he grabs me, punches me twice in the stomach. And I'm just like, ooh, ooh. And then, you know, I I rallied a little bit, but he uh, he definitely got the better of me there. Like got popped me a couple of times, but it was funny because after that, my my rep grew a little bit in the league and like it and it to be honest, I had no idea. Like I it was pure, pure just, just, just doing it. Like, oh yeah, sure. I'll fight this guy. And then on the Jumbotron, like we played in Cleveland, which is the same place where LeBron and the Cavs were playing. And so they have that giant Jumbotron. And on the Jumbotron, it comes up after after the fight. It goes like Kevin Tanzi, like four, two, and one, and seven fights in his career. And those are all my junior fights. And then they put that up on the Jumbotron. And it goes, it goes Gallant, like 147, 82, and 102 or something. Like a, just a ridiculous record. And I'm just like looking at that as I'm going off. I'm like, I fought that guy. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not in a body bag right now. Yeah. <laughs> so how much did you fight when you were in North America? Um, not too much. I mean, obviously with the the brain injury ha- passed, I was aware of that it's and probably that was not kind of, recommended. Yeah, it was in the back of my mind, but I knew that that was had to be part of my game just because of the way I play and you know the style I play and being a bigger guy and I you know I like to get after it a little when bit. When I and, was in the AHL, if you were six four, you're gonna have to fight. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I had. I think I had in like 45 games in the American League, I think I had like three, maybe four fights. And then on the coast, I had like another another five to seven fights, I'd say. So maybe like 10, 10 or 12 pro fights. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think I had about a handful. I pretty well lost everyone, except for one. Yeah. One, ta- like a- one yeah. time I hit the guy right in the face with my knuckles and the guy went down and never played the rest of the night. Yeah, yeah. Punched them right in the face, folks. (laughs) Right in the kisser. (laughs) With the Daytona Beach Bombers. (laughs) I'll never forget winning a fight. It was so fun. Losing isn't as much fun. (laughs) It's like an animal out there. Like it's you got you're like a gladiator. Like you got three thousand people cheering because there's nothing like getting the juices flowing, like getting in a fight. I remember my hands would be shaking after and everything because your adrenaline is just going so wild and like. You, it takes a while to calm down after for me and for like an hour at least. Oh, and I, you'd be, I'd be so exhausted. I'd want to be in the fetal position, sucking my thumb, but anywho, yeah. next poster pick Clarkson looks like you're with your parents. And is that a brother? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's my family there. Um, Clarkson was about two hours from my house. So I was fortunate enough where my parents, that's, it, pre- eh? that's cool. Yeah. It's right over the border. Like it's right over the border in Cornwall. Like it's, 40 minutes from Canada. So fun um, fact, I, can I do it? Fun fact for the shed folks is uh shed guy, Chris Brooks, my college coach at Western Michigan is now the assistant coach at Clarkson. Oh, wow. All right. Brooksy. 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 All right. Yeah. Good to- yeah. He was a hell of a player and he's a good dude and he's a good coach. Um, Yeah. He's uh, the assistant there in Clarkson. I think he just switched. He was in the shed. He was at Michigan tech and then he just switched this year. Yeah. Um, But anyways, Okay. Clarkson would be cool though to be that close to home because man, that Kalamazoo for me was five and a half hours from home, and my parents still made the trip every weekend. Yeah, I mean, yeah, my parents made it every weekend. Um, obviously, it wasn't as tough because I mean, they pretty much like they had they had friends. We had uh, we had a guy who was on our team who was from like Potsdam, which is where Clarkson is, and they were really good friends with uh, with his parents. So they usually just like stayed in their guest house or you know, rented a hotel in town and just stayed for the weekend. Most weekends. So it was pretty oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our parents, when they got down to Kalamazoo, they'd be right at our college parties at night. Yeah. They'd be mucking it right up with us. <laughs> um, yeah. Another way we know each other is one of your teammates at Clarkson. I used to pump iron with him and his brother, Zach Delpy, Ben Delpy. Eh? Oh, okay. Benny boy. Benny boy. Yep. Yeah. He's from Paris, Ontario. We would, 
pump iron and Waterloo, Ontario together for a summer. I think he had just got the scholarship or he was, he was playing out in BC or something at the time. I don't know. He hadn't gone to Clarkson yet though. I don't think. Yeah, he was, uh, we got him out of BC. He's a, he's a super good dude. He's working for the St. Louis blues now, which is pretty cool. Is he really? What does he do for them? Do you think? I'm not exactly sure his exact. His brother's still doing it, though. Eh? His brother's still in the A. Yeah, his brother's an American League legend. He's uh just like just a super likable family. Just just good great folks. I know. I want to get. I want to. I want to get the Dolpies in my shed too. But that Zach's he was a hell of a player. I never saw him. I've seen him on TV, but yeah, he played with the Canucks a bit, right, and all that. But yeah, yeah, he, yeah, I think it was like a hundred games in the NHL, maybe more than that. I'm not sure. That's when I realized I was losing it. Was when I worked out with him and some other fellas, like uh, Spalling, that was in uh, Nashville or whatever, and we would do these like obstacle course races, and I would lose by so much that it was embarrassing. That like people would actually be laughing at me, and I was trying my hardest. And they were like six four, and they could bound and run and jump. It was horseshit. <laughs> I have a story like that from uh, from high school. I used to uh, I used to just do track. Like I would join. I went to a super small high school. I graduated with like fifty people, kind of thing. Um, so I would basically join every sports team I could until it interfered with hockey. And one of those was track and field. And because it's just a, such a small area, the qualifications to get into like provincials were weren't, weren't not, too hard. Not much at all. So I ran. I ran. Uh, I did high jump. I did 400 meters and I did uh, 3,000 meters in, in in track. And just because like I never trained for it, I was just like, yeah, I'm an athlete. I'm I can manage it. I'll get to miss you know an extra four days of school. And so I ended up I ended up making it to, I think like six people were in the 3,000 meter race and four four people qualified for provincials from our area. And I finished as like the fourth person. And I was there like hockey hockey size and i was this was grade 11 and i think you know by that time i was probably close to like six feet ish like five five ten five eleven and just like 200 pounds like big boy and yeah. maybe not 200 but like 185 and i get to provincials and i still didn't train at all just like went off my hockey training and being an athlete i get there and i get to the line and I'm thinking, I'm like, you know, I hope there's like one guy who I can beat, like finish like second or third last. I get there and everyone there is like six feet, 130 pounds and like skinny, wearing fell, like skinny fellows. <laughs> yeah, I'm wearing like a like a, a hockey t-shirt and just like basketball shorts. I got lapped by everybody in the race besides two people. Like it looked like I finished third last by like a hair. But you actually had another round. I had to do a whole lap on my own and people were like, the the next people were setting up like the hurdles were next and people were like bringing the hurdles onto the uh, you're just giving her like, oh, no, I, got to, I got to do one more lap got to do one more lap it was uh, oh god you should have yeah, seen me in Germany man as soon as you said 400 meters my I almost puked we would run yeah. so much in Germany for a month yeah. man it was disgusting I don't want to talk about it moving on one of your poster pictures with your gal at a soccer match or football. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's here in Denmark. We got a uh, we got a nice. Uh, Herning's football. got a squad. I remember Sunder Yuski also had a f- football team or soccer team, whatever you want to call it. And I remember going to a game. It was good, good entertainment. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool, man. It's a good good little date night. Um, you don't know, get to see the atmosphere. I've seen sports over here. I mean, you know, sports over here are just so much cooler to go to live. People are. I think any right sport now. is better live. I mean, it's like watching the nhl on tv is boring to me but going to watch an under 11 match in town that's exciting yeah that's fair yeah um so we haven't had a love story in a while where'd you meet her um so she is uh friends like my one of my best friends is um dating one of her they've been, i mean they've been together for like seven or eight years now and they've they uh kind of Kind of planted the seed. I don't want to say introduced us, but planted the seed and, uh, you know, messaged each other. Started so talking. She, she's over there with you in Denmark? No, she's not. She works for the Canadian government. So she's got a pretty good job. So we didn't want to, we wanted to uh, kind of wait and see. We're still fairly new. We've been, mm-hmm. you know, we, you know, it was end of summer when we started hanging out. We just wanted to see how it goes. And Okay. It's been- so it's fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Relatively fresh for sure. 
Well, she should be proud she made your poster because I said you could put whatever you wanted on it, right? <laughs> whatever I want. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what else do I got? Better, but next page. Growing up in Hammond then. So um, there's some French out there. No. Oh, man, we had Francais. Oh, tu parles français. <laughs> oh, I sure do. <laughs> ah, ich kann sprechen ein bisschen Deutsch, aber ich vergesse all mein français. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll just say all right then. Yeah, I I, I did French immersion until like grade nine. After grade nine, I stopped because they're going to make me take history in French immersion. I'm like, I can't do that. Sorry. No. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I forgot all of it. Once I learned German, man, the French, every time I try to speak French, the German comes out, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah, I guess that makes sense. I, I, I went to, uh, I went to school in French until high school. So like it was, I was at a French. Really? And then English at home though. Yeah. Yeah. Like our family's English. My first day at elementary school, I didn't speak a lick of English or a, a lick of French. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, Hammond, how big that small town then, eh? Size, size of this podcast, basically. <laughs> like it's two people in the town. It's now it's I like, love it. Do you go back there in the summers then now? Where do you go? Yeah. Well, last summer, um, I usually end up in Ottawa just because it's like 45 minutes from from the city. So I usually try to find a spot in Ottawa. And uh, the last two summers, I've lived at my parents' place just because one one year was complete COVID. And um, I had forfeited like a month or two of rent just because everything shut down and I needed a gym. And there was a gym at my parents' place. So moved back there. And then this past summer, I just went straight to my parents' house because I didn't know what the situation in COVID was going to be. And I didn't want to risk losing another couple thousand dollars on rent that I would just have to kind of be like, well, I'm not staying here. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's probably similar to like where I am. I'm in Concord, Ontario, uh, the yeah. other side of Toronto from you. Uh, but we're in a small town and then you got to leave to go play AAA, right? So it looks like you had to do the same. Um, It wasn't really leave. But it was a very a lot of big travel. Team. Yeah, yeah. Like our we had practices two, three times a week that were like sometimes an hour, an hour and a half away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's what I meant. I didn't mean like leave home, but yeah, like oh, everybody's yeah. from little towns all over, right? And yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's the Eastern Ontario Wild. Yes, sir. Uh, sounds very similar to the Gray Bruce Highlanders around here. But uh, so you started doing that. At what age did you start doing triple A? So we didn't have AAA in Ottawa until my my major bantam year. So I was double A until major bantam came around. Decided to switch to D man because we had a lot of good forwards in the area and made it as a D man and played two years of AAA until I went to juniors. Okay, so they have drafts for juniors there because the research team saw you got drafted tenth overall to the Cumberland grads. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like, besides the USHL, I think it's like the only junior league besides the USHL and the major junior leagues that have a draft. Um, Right. So you don't get to choose where you're going to play junior hockey. eh? They tell you that's kind of weird. It is. It is weird. I'm not like, I mean, it's a, it's a, the issue is that players, I mean, people know that you want to go to Toronto if you want to be seen. And that's just kind of how it always been for hockey. Like we had, I mean, we had Alan Quine, and Cody CC, who were on my team in, um, sorry, Cody CC was on, he's, he's in the NHL has yeah 600 NHL games to this point. Um, and he, uh, so he left for the Peterborough Peets when we became the wilds, just because exposure, there's way more exposure out in Toronto. And then Alan Quine, who has like a hundred NHL games and like 500 American league games, he, he moved after our first year in the wild and he went and played with the junior Canadians. And that's just, that's just kind of how it is. Like there's more exposure there. There's more Toronto is the biggest hockey city in the world. Um, yeah. It's a meat market in minor hockey around there though. Exactly. It's so not for they, me, man. I'll go play them in tournaments, but that shit ain't for me. <laughs> you know, yeah. like those guys, I remember those kids would be on different teams. Like one year you'd show up and they're playing for St. Mike's or then they're playing for the Marlboros or then they're playing for the Red Wings. And like, they'd be switching teams all the time. And like the parents didn't really look like they were a family. Didn't look like a hockey family. It wasn't my type of shit. That's all. Yeah, I mean, one did one parent would rent an apartment on a different side of town just so they could, just have so they a- could be on the better team or whatever. It's all horse manure in my eyes, but whatever. So Cumberland grads, how far is that from home? About a 12 minute drive. Oh, so your hometown team took you. That's nice of them. 
Fun team. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty cool. It was a good spot because they were no good when I went there. They were still no good while I was there. Um, but um, you know, I let let me play a lot. We uh, you know, I stepped in as a 16 year old and I was playing top D man minutes, so that was really good for my uh, yeah growth as a player for sure. No kidding. So then, um, you ever think of major junior? How do you end up going the NCAA route? Yeah, so I I was drafted in the OHL too um, by the Plymouth Whalers. Uh, I was like a either eighth or ninth round draft pick. And it was one of those things where my parents really, really showed me NCAA, like they were good and yeah. to schools at a young age. Um, I went to the OHL rookie camp, actually did really well. And they told me, I mean, I'm sure they tell us to a lot of their draft picks, they don't want to lose to college, but they told me that I would have made it as a 16 year old, but it would have been as like a seventh defenseman kind of thing. And, you know, it was in the States and yeah. been that far from home. And I, I knew that they would have probably wanted to turn me into a tough guy kind of thing. And I was just kind of, you know, I'll wait, wait one year, play juniors. I'll be able to play a lot there. Yeah. And um, after, you know, I guess it was around like Christmas time, my 16 year old year, like maybe January, my 16 year old year, I uh, got a call from Clarkson and liked the, like the atmosphere there, liked how I was close to home and committed. So did you go for a recruiting trip? Yeah. Um, actually, not really, no, because I was too young at the time. I went, I went. Uh, I used to like take a, out the recruits. I don't remember taking out many sixteen-year-olds. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Like I've, I've, I was in charge of recruiting trips just because fun is fun, and I like that fun. Is fun, and uh, I was yeah. also in charge of them too. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, <laughs> I never just because of how old I was. I never like you know they didn't bring a sixteen-year-old. <laughs> so oh, I, I'm, I'm over that topic. You took out the recruits at Clarkson. <laughs> Yeah, man, those were some of my favorite nights because, like, the coaches would say, "Wally, we really, really want this guy." <laughs> <laughs> I remember when the one guy came and they're like, "Just give us whatever receipts. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Just get it done." <laughs> it was, uh, especially the year I redshirted, right? Because I wasn't playing all year that year. So they're like, "You're the guy who's who's showing them everything, taking them out before the game, taking them out after the game, and like, you know." And, and, you know, like, it's an important role because it actually does factor in on how good your team's going to be. If the coaches are saying, we want this kid, get make it happen. And then it's kind of up to you and the fellows to, like, make it so much fun. So yeah. much fun that they literally can't turn you down, right? <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd say I'm, I'm uh, I mean, don't want to say 100% responsible, probably closer to 110% responsible, but um, for – three three guys who ended up coming yeah mm-hmm. yeah no and that's fun when you hear they committed and you're like yes I did it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> a good time in the town and oh god that's fun there's two bars but you could uh you could have a lot of fun at those two bars so you already had the scholarship but then you play another year that eh? in junior right? uh yeah yeah so i had a full i did year. the same thing i had another whole year to play and i'd already committed to western michigan yeah yeah, takes the pressure off, doesn't it? Then you can just have fun. Yeah, exactly. Get to grow your game and you know have have tips from. I was supposed to have two more years. Um, because I went in as a true freshman because Mark Borowiecki, who's uh in oh, Nashville, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, that, uh, that guy's an animal. Yeah, oh yeah, he is. He's a he's a nicest guy in the world, but also the meanest guy on the ice. It's it's crazy. That's, that's how it works, though. That's how those guys are. And I bet you he's just the best guy, probably. He's a super dude. And so he he signed after his junior year. And so that made me come in a year early. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. And then were you ready for it then as a true freshman? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I, I had a good year. I think I had nine or 10 points my first year as a freshman in like 40 games. And my, you know, my job wasn't really to put up points. Oh, um, that freshman year, man, it's, it's a lot, a lot of guys have a hard time getting into it, right? Yeah, well, and that's what's tough about, you know, you have, you have your first impression and that's what's tough about college now. I mean, I guess you can transfer without having a red shirt now, which is awesome, but still um, you can do that yeah well so there's my 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 incoming class the coach that i committed for committed under got fired the summer i was coming in and that's so that's not, going, not always cool right because yeah yeah so we had we had nine players in my original freshman class um and three of them graduated from clarkson because just like 
the coach wanted different players. The coach wanted, you know, different the people. The coach and... that recruits you, you're going to want him to be there because he's the reason you're there. He's the one that wants yeah. you. Yeah. yeah they, mm. But he knew I was a shed guy. So he just, uh, <laughs> and those things like, matter, folks. That, exactly. that matters. Um, there was a guy on your team that I remember from playing against him because he said something really funny to me, I thought. Uh, Luke Oakley. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He played in somewhere in Germany. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it was the cough board jokers, but um, I'm pretty sure we had like just won the championship and I was like second in the league in scoring. And then we played him and he started chirping me saying, who are you? And everything else like, I don't even know who you are. And you just got here. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, uh, okay. He was not, he that wasn't an effective chirp. I did not think I, I laughed. He was, I thought it was funny because I didn't even know who he was. And he was playing a cough board or something. I mean, my my it's my favorite chirp back to who are you is like man like we're literally playing in the same league we're all and, in the same league and you're on that <laughs> team and I'm on this team what are you talking yeah, about was, yeah, like I don't know who you are either I we're playing in the Denmark league like I don't know uh, anybody in <laughs> yeah I I just thought it was hilarious I was like well I don't know who you are but you're playing a cough board and they got a tiny budget so I'm not sure what's going on man oh god i thought it was funny okay so you missed a whole year i got that so how is the clarkson barn because you know um small world was they started sending me the pamphlets you know but like back in the day where they'd send you the like magazine about the school and uh they started sniffing around and then uh, i'm pretty sure what happened though is then chris blight signed there um out of our league who's a shed guy and then they already had their scoring right winger and then they moved on you know yeah, hey, yeah, fair enough. It it was a cool spot. I mean, it was very much small town USA where like you're good, you're the king of the town, and you're bad. They like hockey and Clarkson, don't they? Yeah, they like hockey. It's it's like especially like I mean, our the population of Clarkson or the enrollment of Clarkson was like thirty five hundred people. So it's like it it was super small. So if if you that were good, small. we'll get behind you, and if you weren't good you were a last kind of thing to do on a Friday, Saturday night. Yeah. Well, so how did you guys do while you're there? Not great. Um, my first year was probably, well, it wasn't technically my first year there because we didn't want to play off series there, but that was the team that would have, that had the most weapons kind of thing. And then we, we just kind of underachieved um, playoff time. We, uh, we had a game, we actually went to, I think it was, it was the longest game in ECAC history um, up to that point. I don't know if it's been broken, but we went to, uh, we played RPI in the first round of playoffs. We lost the first game. It's best out, you know, it's best out of three for yeah. college. We lost the first game. Second game went to like, I think we scored with like a minute 40 left in the third overtime period or something like that. It was nuts. Like we, man, we like, I remember it was, it, the game ended at like midnight. And we like on our floor in our locker room was just like every piece of food and liquid you could think of that's in the arena was like in our locker room. We had like pickle juice, sandwiches, you had hot dogs, chocolate bars, bags of chips. Like how many periods did you play? Six total. Six total. So three overtimes. Yeah. I had I played in two matches i think that were that long um one was in the coast in the semifinals against florida and jiminy crickets were we tired <laughs> there were guys cramping and i had to leave the game and like we're in florida so it's hot as balls and yeah. man that but you're going into that third overtime and you're just like could somebody please end this shit <laughs> something on that score the other one was actually in denmark game one of the playoffs Sounder Yuski against uh, whatever team bet against themselves. <laughs> another another Danish team for sure. Yeah. Um. Obviously they weren't that memorable if I can't remember their name, but we won the overtime game, and then I think we won the series in five or something. For, go. God, what team is that? Ugh, it's bothering me. <laughs> um. Anywho, okay. So, you have a good college career though, even though you you had to sit out here because of that incident um so then your senior year you did what i did you left right after the season and went and played in the ahl eh? yeah yeah went to uh, sign in binghamton how did, did when did you get an agent well i had an agent before i was even in college like i had well not an agent but a family advisor that yeah, you know yeah. we would, mm -hmm. we would 
like pay someone to come and advise us and stuff. And then once I came into college, basically once I started going to NHL camps and that was, that was after my, well, that was before I even got to college. I went to, to you were going to NHL rookie camps or what? Yeah, I went to, I went to a Sens. I went to two Sens. I went to Toronto first, then two Sens camps. Um, and then I went to St. Louis's my, my last year. What happened to your draft year? If they're asking you all those camps, why didn't you get drafted? It's a good question, man. I don't know. I, uh, I was, I was wondering, I mean, I was getting letters from teams. I was getting calls from teams, but I was, you know, viewed as a, I was the 210th player on the central scouting list. So you on, were ranked that it could happen. It just didn't happen. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. It was like one of the last guys that like take a chance on this guy and yeah, no one. Well, that's yeah. No, that's cool. So then um, your season ends and um, you do go play 11 games for the senator's farm team. Then that's had yeah. you at those camps. So you do know the organization a bit then too, eh? Yeah, I know. I was pretty familiar with it. I mean, there was a couple of guys. Bingo's I... a barn, though, eh? <laughs> it's an interesting spot, man. It's, uh... <laughs> I, had I played an it. HL game there. I think I had at least three chefs. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that really was... mucked her up. <laughs> like, um, there were some games. I dressed for one or two games where I didn't play a single shaft, and I was just, like sitting there. I'm like, Right, of... right. Yeah, so, I yeah. actually did the same. There was a time we bust really far away, like really far away. And then we get there and um and literally like um I played one shift in the first period and it was like an awesome shift. We were all over them. And then I never got another shift the rest of the game. I just sat there. I mean there was like some things I didn't really understand too. Like there was a game that we were in I was in Binghamton and we were like Binghamton was that year Binghamton was in last place from like the eighth game of the season in the league and never got out of last place it was not a good season for them and there was one game where I didn't play a single shift in the game and we lost the game like 7-1 or something I remember like being down like 5-1 in the third period with 10 minutes left and how do you not get a shift how does he not put you out there I I I, I totally agree man it's some of the things that happen in those leagues in North America are wild you know what those coaches would do in the A but anywho um so the 11 games went all right though did you get some ice time some games yeah there's I mean there's some games I played well um like played a decent amount or get like you know 12 to I think maybe like 15 minutes was the most I got. And like, I, uh, I, I mean, I came from the ECAC and my job in the ECAC was to chip pucks off the glass, block shots and murder people in the middle of the ice. Mm-hmm. And when I got to the American league, I was like, okay, this is just going to be good too. And I was like, you know, I was just playing the same way not really thinking of actually making plays. I was just thinking of surviving kind of things. I was nervous. So, I mean, I like didn't play great, but didn't play bad. It was one of those things where I was just kind of like not noticeable, I think. Yeah. I think you really mentally got to believe in yourself and make plays, right? You got to have confidence to make plays when you get to those spots. I was, when I got to the HL, man, I, I was not confident in myself. I, my mental frame was not right. I was looking at everybody else playing hockey instead of worrying about how I was playing, you know? Yeah. Same thing. Mm -hmm. So then what do you sign then for your rookie year? Um, I signed, so initially I signed a one-way coastly coast contract with, um, with, uh, the Kansas city Mavericks and I got invited to St. Louis's, uh, national league rookie camp and then, or the, their tournament. And then I got invited to an AHL camp too. And at the rookie camp, initially it was just the rookie camp, but I went there and it was, it was fun because it was a rookie camp and I was coming out of college. So I was like 24 years old. And all, most of these guys were like 18, 19 major junior players just got drafted. So I was like, I was a young man and they were boys. Yeah. And I made sure I played that way. And, you know, I had, I had a few points in the tournament and was just, you know, a solid, a solid D man as well. So I got invited to the, the main camp and I was pretty fortunate because it was the, it was that year where they had like the team North America and team Canada world cup, um, and St. Louis had like three or four defensemen in that. So they were short on D for the, for the start of camp. So I was playing some of the best hockey I was playing. And I got through a couple of rounds of cuts, played one like exhibition game that was oh, like, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, the first, the first exhibition game I played was like, there was no NHLers in it. So it was, it was cool to just wear the Jersey, but I was like, yeah, this isn't really an NHL exhibition game. Right. And then 
the next one, like I, I, again, I was playing well, made it through a, a round of cuts basically that I thought I wouldn't make it past and end up playing um, another exhibition game. And this one was like super cool. Um, I played in a Saturday night uh, against Chicago Blackhawks in Chicago and they had like Patrick Kane played, um, Panarin played, Seabrook played, uh, Crawford was in Nets. Um, they had like, they just had like, and a, you're a on good... an East coast deal. You must've been playing well. Uh, yeah. It was, Those guys know, that sign East coast deals, they don't even usually expect them to make the East coast. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah. I mean, so, and then after that, after I had done well at the camp, they gave me a two way American league contract. So I was, nice. I it was like a, a split between the coast and the American league that year. I think I played like 25 games in the American league and, and sat you're in... East coast all-star. So you were an ECHL all-star. I never got that done in my year. So that you must, that must be, do you think that's the best talk you've ever played other than this year, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I've, 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 I changed a lot from a player in my college and throughout my career, just because I want to kind of, especially when I went over to Europe, I changed my game completely to more offensive style than like a rugged, tough demon, but my. So you're uh, handling the puck more, making more tape to tapers than just chipping it out. Exactly. Yeah. Like trying to skate with the puck, trying to score some goals, but yeah, that, that is it I'm... college hockey though. It's just a frenzy out there, man. It is just a bunch of guys that are in fantastic shape, skating around a million miles an hour. Hitting each other. Yeah, exactly. Rushing <laughs> each other, just <laughs> mucking it up. <laughs> but yeah, no. And uh, I was, I was a very good year that, that year in the coast. I think I had like, I think I had like 30 points in like 45 games or something like that. And I finished super hot. Like there was, I went on my longest goal heater in my career. I think I scored nine games in a row or something like that. And nine it goals? was like goals. Nine, yeah. I scored nine goals, nine, or I scored, I think I scored like 10 or 11 goals in that spin. Cause I had some two game, some two goal games, but holy I, moly. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty good. It was like, it, it was one of those things where I was just like, once you're hot, you're hot. And like everything I touched just went in the net kind of thing. It, it um, you, you can get into some funky grooves and you can go the opposite way too, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 I'm just more than a while right now. So, <laughs> um, I remember when I would go, I, you know, maybe five games, if I hadn't scored a goal in like five games, it would feel like, like, yeah. what are you doing different? What am I doing? And it's like when you get a chance, and you just, you weren't as relaxed. You weren't feeling it. You weren't like, you'd be looking at the goalie instead of like the open top cheese, you know? Yeah. I feel <laughs> and that. then it takes a cheesy one to go in and you're like, oh yeah, I know how to do that. <laughs> it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hockey's a weird game that way. Um, But that's really cool that you went from an East Coast deal to earning um, a two-way out of camp because Man, not many guys on East Coast deals get invited to any camps or actually get to play in the HL or even make the East Coast team, right? Like the East Coast usually signs 70 guys and then you show up and you're like, actually, we're not really, we're only taking about seven of you because the rest are getting sent down later. <laughs> yeah, those contracts are, are wild how easily they can throw them away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't, they don't mean a lot. <laughs> um. Okay, so... uh I guess where is the uh, East Coast team you played for? Uh, I played Missouri. for Kansas City my first year, and then I played in Toledo, Ohio. I thought it said the Missouri Mavericks. Yeah, so it is the Missouri Mavericks, but it's it's in Kansas City. Ah, Kansas City, Missouri. Who cool. knew? <laughs> exactly. Right. So Kansas City's a nice spot. Yeah, really cool spot. It was a pretty pretty cool sports hub. Great barbecue there. Um, they had like uh we we had our owner our owner's dad own the Chiefs. So we got to go to a few of those games too. So that was pretty cool. Um it's a really cool city. Um yeah, I've never been, obviously. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> um so what's the East Coast All-Star game? Like that's a pretty big deal. You're six foot four and making the All-Star team, man, and you didn't get drafted. Huh. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, it was a fun experience. It was, you know, it was something new. Um, had a lot of family and friends there, which was nice because it was in upstate New York. It was close to home. Um, it was actually really close, close to where I went to college. It was only like an hour and a half away from there. So that was fun to get some family and friends out there and, 
Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it's like an all-star game, right? Like there's, it's not much, uh, not much real competition, just a lot of fun and goofing around and trying plays and stuff. And it was good. Mm-hmm. Um, So there was a guy on your coast team that is in the NHL now, eh? Carter Verhage. Looks like wow. he just ran a muck down there. 32 points in 16 games at the coast. That's a lot. Yeah, he didn't deserve to, like, when he was in the coast, I kept saying, like, what, what is this guy? What it, yeah, like, why isn't he up? Like, it's like it's he's he literally gets like two and a half points per game. Like, it's just like, all right, like and it pisses other players off when they see stuff that doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> yeah, you're just like, who, like, what, what happened in this guy's like, why? Yeah, <laughs> why isn't this guy up? Like, mm-hmm. Well, he is up, folks, he's all the way up, right? Um, when you did get called up to the Chicago Wolves, there was a roller hockey enthusiast that ran a muck when I was in college. Uh, he went to Colorado college, uh, Brett Sterling. Yeah. yeah. That, that guy is a little player. Eh? Sterling, yeah. He is, he is a few championships in the American league. Um, he's an agent legend. Yeah. Yeah. He, he really is. He's a nice guy, funny fella. He's just, uh, you know, from Chicago, loved, loved to be around there and just kind of, he was a good leader. He was a good guy. Um, yeah, I played roller hockey against him. And then, like, when I was one of the finalists there for the Hobie or whatever, was Sterling and Surditch were line mates, and Surditch won it. And they ran a muck that season. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so then after that year, you're a Coast All Star. You're getting 31 points in 44 games. So then, what do you sign the next year? Because the next year, it's all Coast. Why? I signed a two way deal again in um grand rapids and i just didn't really have a great season to be honest with you i mean it was like it was uh, so it was, ju- it was justified then is what you're saying well it was it wasn't that i had a bad season it was that detroit had a good american league team and they had a lot of d-men and where i was in toledo was also a very good team so i didn't get the opportunity to play like 25 to 27 minutes at night because we you know we had four or five good defensemen. So we just kind of all of us played like 20 to 22 minutes a night kind of thing. Um, so there wasn't as much exposure um, as much room for me to put points up. And yeah, it was a, it was a new place and just didn't, uh, didn't work out to get called up there. Hmm. Well, I hear Toledo's like a sweet barn and people like playing there though, right? Amazing, man. It's, it's insane. It's wild to play there. You're on like a Tuesday night, you get 7,000 fans. Really? I played in the old Toledo arena and it was wild in that part. <laughs> oh, there was not 7,000 people in that arena, but mad, they were crazy. <laughs> Those are some memories I'll never forget playing in Toledo, man. Uh, one guy that was on your team, though, was a former Bronco, Shane Burschback. Yeah, he's a bit of a legend there, isn't he? Oh, yeah. He's uh, the all-time leader. I was actually wishing him happy Thanksgiving earlier. He was. Uh, he's the all-time all time points and assist leader for Toledo Walleye, I think. Just a just a super guy. Nice, like vision, unlike anybody else I've really played with. Again, another guy where I'm just kind of like, why why isn't this guy in the American League? Um yeah, he he just controlled the play when he got the puck. He's probably responsible for in my two years in Toledo, he's probably responsible for the first assist on like 60% of my goals, I'd say. Just like he's a player though. Play. I've never and, met him up and he would just hit you late and just walk in and score yeah he's a he's a cool guy pretty quiet um you know he's got uh he's got two kids now doing uh doing the dad life and just living in michigan so um yeah he i is he a beauty because broncos are usually beauties yeah he's a he's a pretty pretty awesome dude for sure yeah they usually are from western michigan just saying you know um okay so the next season, you do go back to Toledo again, eh? Was it a two-year deal you're on with Grand Rapids, or what are you on? Is it a one-way A deal, or are you doing a two-way? So it was a two-way. My first year with Toledo was a two-way American League deal. And then my next year, I had, like, two-way American League deals offered to me, but I wanted to just go Coast. ECHL to yeah. try to get all up to any team. Yeah. Um, and that worked out. Ended up playing in Stockton for, like, 15 games or something like that. Um, but I was there for... I was there for probably like three to three and a half months. And it was like 
You know, it was like even though I wasn't playing in a lot of the games, it was still like you're there, you're in the A, like, right? Yeah, like playing hockey. It was a pretty cool experience. Yeah, it you know, it can get mentally tough when you're in the coast, right? Because you feel so far away. And then when you get to the A, you're like, wow, I'm right there, right? But I'm actually making money. <laughs> yeah, but then they're like, there's a difference between becoming like that full time like a jeller that like gets to play right like i never even got to try and play <laughs> just sit <Yeah>. there <laughs> I, I, the, I, chicago was probably the place where i got the most ice time when i was in the american league honestly um i was in when i was in stockton it was uh it was definitely stockton was definitely my my knock on like okay you're not a prospect anymore time to go to europe because i had like I started off super hot when I got called up, I was doing really well in Toledo and I started up like full on playing six defenseman minutes, um, like 14 to 16 minutes a game. And I started with four points in my first four games. Like I got a point in every game, my first four games. And then my fifth game, I didn't get a point. And I was like minus one. I got healthy scratch for like five games in a row after that. And I was like, all right, like, like really like, I, uh. like, like, with a leash kind of thing and then you know it's uh, you know how it is with draft you got to be and- mentally tough man in north american yeah. pro hockey but i guess we did talk about how stressful it is everywhere it's not like you go to europe and it's not stressful so yeah. it is what it is right <laughs> exactly uh but when you're in the coast that year it looks like you guys almost win it with toledo and i've actually talked to a fella about that season matt register the horse oh, yeah he's been on yeah. twice and he came on to meet my under 11 concurrent canucks last year great guy Right on, right on. Yeah, Reg is a cool dude. Yeah, we uh, we lost in six. Uh, still a sore sore spot. You go that far, and especially the coast, like I know, the travel and torment the full Man, season. It's a grind. Those playoffs in the coast, isn't it? Like you got one one guy on every coast team who doesn't care if he breaks your neck out there, kind of thing. You know, like it's it's a oh. it's a jungle. Yeah, yeah. We, you we really got to muck her up to get to the finals of the coast. I. I was ruined after my season in the coast. Like I, with the a- preseason, the AHL games, the coast games, and then the playoffs. I remember adding it up. I think I had played 102 hockey matches that season and I was completely ruined. And then to think that like the next season is only like two months away. And you're like, and you guys want me to get bigger and stronger and I'm this ruined and it's two months away. Like what, wh- what can a hockey player do really to actually improve themselves in that amount of time? Right. <laughs> Mine was even worse because it was the first year I went to. Uh, we lost, we lost our last game. I think was June fifth, um, and that was when we lost. I got on a flight to Vegas for my buddy's bachelor party on the sixth. Stayed there till the ninth, and the ninth of June, and then I shipped off to Zanoimo on the twentieth of July. Mm-hmm. So it was like mm-hmm. I had just over a month to like for a new season. I was like, I was beat up, man. Like it's full, full year in the coast in the American league and having, and, and then the, the, the training camp, what was it like then? It, so we're there now let's talk. Actually two more guys you played with. I was going to drop names on your toes. TJ Hensick was one of the most impressive college players I ever played against at the university of Michigan. Um, I run power plays and I'm a little right-handed shot. And then I saw him come out. And he was way better than me. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he was awesome. He was a cheat code on our team. Like he was. God, he's good. Yeah. Asshole. Yeah, <laughs> our team in Toledo was like basically bring us to the cup. It was literally like we started every game one nothing because we had him on our team basically. Mm, yeah, he's that- good. And then you had a D man that's good too. He's he seems to be running amok with the Cardiff Devils, my favorite team. Uh, Crawford. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh. I didn't really, we didn't really see him as much because he was up and down a lot with, uh, with uh, Grand Rapids. But yeah, okay. he's uh, another, another good guy. Okay, so then you're heading to Orly Znojmo. Znojmo. What? <laughs> Znojmo. 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 Um, <laughs> how do you end up there? I just got placed there by my agent. To be honest with you, I mean, I was. Oh really? Like your agent yeah. just says, "I got this for you. You're going here." You did. It wasn't like. No, yeah. I mean, it was kind of, it was, I mean, it was when I did it, it was when you go over to Europe, like you kind of have to make your own resume in Europe. 
unless if you're one of those guys who has 300 games in the American League and a handful right. of games in the yeah. and just in the top league. And this was the Austrian League, which was like a, you know, it's a decent league. Um, and so he was just like, yeah, it's a pretty good opportunity. Um, you'll be able to play a lot. And yeah, it was um, And they're in Czech. It's called yeah. Czechia now, right? Not Czech Republic, I think. They changed the. Someone told me that. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, I think they changed it. Um. So how was that? How's Czech food? <laughs> I like food. Let's talk about Czech food. Czech food's pretty good. Um, a lot of a lot of pork and potatoes. Um, mm-hmm. they have they have this creamy garlic soup that's like a Czech, kind of like thing. It's so good. Um, mm-hmm. big thing there about like is lunch specials. They had like anywhere like anywhere in the city where I played in a super small city, like 25,000 people. Um, so everything was super cheap. Check is super cheap to begin with. And there were like lunch specials there for like, you would get a big like bowl of soup. That was basically like bottomless soup. You could refill it. You got a side salad and the main, whatever it was. And it was always different. Like the soup rotated a little bit, but the actual meal was like, you know, there was probably like a rotation of like, 12 to 15 different meals so it wasn't always like the same thing um sounds it, lovely it was 100 it was 100 check crowns which was like at the time was like four dollars canadian so it actually like didn't even make sense to, to really? make home yeah was, why would you buy groceries when you can do that yeah, exactly. yeah I, I ate there for lunch a lot of times i miss eating out a lot like when i was a hockey player in germany i would eat out all the time because it was like affordable and fun and now in Canada, it's really hard to eat out. Yeah, if you want to get a beer and your bill just quadruple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I remember when we, like I was like nineteen, twenty. You'd go to bars and have a, a bunch of beers with the guys, and to think of how much that would cost nowadays, it's crazy. It would definitely, uh, definitely ramp up the price. Mm-hmm. So, um. Did you, you enjoyed that season then? Um, what I saw that there was quite a few Canadians on your team for a Czech team. Yeah, we, uh, I think we had like four or five. It was a good season. It was, uh, it was a weird place. The owner, um, you know, he was a a little bit of a different guy. We, he was, he was just old school Czech. Uh, he didn't speak a lick of English. Mm -hmm. Most, none of the coaches spoke any English, um, except for our head coach who was not there very often. Um, Miroslav Freiter. Did you say so, your head coach wasn't there very often? Yeah. So he was Miroslav Freiser, who he was super, super awesome dude. He was like, he was the second or third Czech player to play in the NHL. And like his story is basically like he got smuggled out of Czech during war to go play in the NHL. And really? he has like, he, he had his liver replaced at like 39 years old. Um, Like he, he played with the Leafs. He was a top scorer for the Leafs. Like, a couple of years while he was there has like a point per game in his career. What's his uh, name? Miroslav Freiser. Hmm. I don't and think I know that name. He, he was um like, he played like, he played a long time ago, like seventies, maybe seventies, yeah. I'd say. And he um seventies or eighties. And then, yeah. So he, he obviously, I mean, he, he was 60 at the time, but he like walked around like he was, you know, he had some, he had some miles on his body for sure. And, uh, yeah, he, so he wasn't there that often. Um, but yeah, we like, it was just like kind of classic check. Like every problem is solved by just working harder, not working smarter. We, mm-hmm. uh, lost one game we played in, um, Balzano, which was in Italy. And that was like seven hours away from us. And we got stomped. Like we lost like seven or eight, nothing. And we get home at like five in the morning and our owner's sitting there and he's like, you guys are getting in your gear and your bag skating. So <laughs> we, yeah, we got on the ice and we, we skated for a little oh, bit. Yeah. Was, like the mentality was like, you guys are out of shape. That's why you lost eight. That, nothing. Hockey's just not oh, that yeah. like, it's like you, when you lose like that, you're already pissed off enough. And then it's like, you make you skate. It's like, what does it accomplish, really, in my opinion? But it was different. Yeah. Um. So the next season, though, you go to Innsbruck in the ice hockey league, right? Yes. So oh. is is Eb, is the E B E L whatever Ebel is that Same considered way. like a higher league than ice hockey league, or is that the same? 
It's the exact same league. It just changed names. Is that right? Jeez, I should know that after all the time in my shed, eh? <laughs> oh, that's okay. okay. Uh, so yeah. you go to Innsbruck. That's a nice town, eh? Yeah, it's it was living in a postcard. Living in the, the Austrian Alps was it was crazy. Like the Winter Olympics have been there twice. Um, the only thing that was just a drag was it was like the biggest, heaviest COVID year. So everything uh, pretty much the entire time I was there. So you don't really get to live it up then. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, the group of guys... The group of guys that I played with that year, excuse me, was like hands down the best group of guys I've ever played with. Like we still have a group chat of like eight of us where we just that's cool and chat. Yeah, just a really really good group of guys to live a full quarantine life with. And the leading scorer and the guy that ran a muck is now a Sheffield Steeler, Champini. Yeah, Dan Champini, a good buddy of mine. He's yeah. uh, he's a player he's, then. Uh, Oh yeah, he he's a player. He's a player for sure. He played with the Auger last year, actually, for a little bit. Oh really? I think he's doing quite well in Sheffield, but I don't really yeah. look. Um, so that year, you guys are good or what? It's a weird question. Okay. Um, Middle we, of the pack. <laughs> our uh, our imports. I think we had like eight imports. Yeah. And we were all in like the top, like. 25 scoring in the league Mm -hmm. um we had the most goals for and the most goals against in the league that year (laughs) yeah yeah Uh, so it was like we 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 had we just didn't have any depth at all like it was it was tough we yeah we had yeah it was it was a a tough year but we we should have really it's really hard when you play well and you're doing well and like there's a line or two that are really doing well and but the team just really isn't all putting it together yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. we lost a lot of like like six five games or like seven six games like it was oh that'd be annoying it was annoying but it was like it was also fun hockey like it's just like yeah (laughs) high flying (laughs) not a fan in the stands all year long that's not fun that was yeah that was that's not cool um so then how do you end up in then kosic slovakia yeah so kosice slovakia um got got offered there got offered more money than i'd been offered in my pro career so in slovakia eh? i've seen some players go there in the last few years i never i never even sniffed around that there it's kind of like the like it's it's tough living in Slovakia like it's it's a it's a different world a little bit um mm-hmm. but uh like like there was like a convicted murderer in our league um he stabbed somebody 17 times to death and wow. he did like three or four years in prison and got out on good behavior and then he played in our league really first year out so like that just kind of a nutshell of what Slovakia mm-hmm. is a little bit like it gets a it's that's it's, interesting. Definitely, definitely some culture shock there. Um, but yeah, it was uh, you know it was a good contract offer in, in a bigger city, so I went with it. And you were there for a, twenty games, and then you must have got a pretty good deal to leave then to go to Cometa Brno. Yeah, yeah, it was a situation where I just my coach and I we really weren't getting along, um, and you know we just agreed to part ways, and I kind of knew that I was when I kind of asked the part ways, I knew, I mean, I was, you knew that you could get elsewhere. And well, I was, better. I was a great year. I think I had at the time, I think I had like 20 games played with like 11 goals and like six assists or something like that. As and, a D man. Yeah, exactly. I was leading our team in goals and um, just for some reason, the coach and I didn't see head eye to eye. And, uh, and usually uh, coaches yeah. like the guys that are doing well, you know? I mean, usually, I mean, it was basically one of those things where I was, it was, uh, you know, we were, we just argued a good amount. And then we went on a really cold streak where I was actually playing good hockey and was putting up almost a point per game in that streak, but we lost like six or seven in a row. Mm -hmm. And he basically brought me in. He told me I, there was one, the game before I went, like, we lost like three, nothing. And I went minus three, um, wasn't a good game. And then he brings me into his office the next day. I was like, I'm going to scratch you for the next game. And basically, basically his reasoning was that I'm going to make an example of you. Um, and I was like, I'm not cool with that. And so I called my agent and was just kind of, you know, seeing what my options were. 
yeah. ended up winning the game to break a, like a seven or eight game losing streak that I was out for. And we were playing against the last place team. We, we win the game. And then, so he scratches me for the next game. Oh God. And at that point, I was just like, all right, man, like, yeah, I'm out. Like, yeah, you, you want me to be here. I'm, I'll take my services elsewhere. And then, yeah, I ended up signing in a better league um, yeah. for more money on, um, you know, in a, in a, in a cool city and got to yeah. play against Yacht and Krejci and Placanitz and And that's a hell so, of a league to get into. There's not many imports that get to go to the Czech top league. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a tough league to get into. It definitely is. So then how did the rest of that season go? I saw you did have a player on that team, Peter Mueller, eh? Yeah, he's incredible. I mean, yeah. It's weird how he's been in Europe running amok in every league and everywhere he goes that he still isn't in the NHL, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's just a whole different game, right? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a great guy, great teammate, great hockey player. Um, well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, we really connected on the ice, which was cool. Um, he, uh, we played well together when we were out there together. Um, so yeah, you lived some time in the Czech then. Um, so how was that town? That's a bigger city then, eh? Yeah, it was way way different. Like people spoke English. Um, it was much more professional. I mean, it's a more professional league. Yeah, um, it's a big city, so there was English. So that was definitely a little bit less shell shocked than when I was in Snowmo. So then, how do you get from there to the Herning Blue Foxes? Uh, yeah, again, I mean, mostly when you're over here, you kind of put your your life in your hands of your agent, um, mm-hmm. kind of see where you can get slotted in because of everything of, I mean, I had a, I had a pretty good year in the Czech league last year and was talking about resigning with uh, Bruno for a while. And then it just went cold when everything kind of happened with Russia, mm-hmm. um, Ukraine. And, you know, obviously that horrible situation there led to a lot of players boycotting the KHL. Yeah. Like, I mean, team, like there was a bunch of national league teams that said that if you play in the KHL, you won't be on our national league team. Like you'll be banned from it. So that brought back, I mean, a, I think a lot of players the team that I was, the team that I was on last year, Cometa had only has one North American on it this year, just because like they brought back, they brought back like six guys from the KHL. So it was one of those things where that league filled up. Same with the German league and, you know, I just got, got a little got, bit of a yeah. down, uh, bump, but, um, you know, happy to be in Hernan. Got a, got a pretty good deal here living on a lake on a first place team shed guy. So, yeah, that that's fun. Winning's fun, right? Like that's it's interesting, fun. right? You can go to uh, some leagues the, for maybe some more money, but you could end up on bottom teams and man, being on bottom teams in Europe just is ugh, not fun. <laughs> Being in first place with Herning is fun, right? It is fun, and fun is fun. Fun is fun. Um, yeah, so that Bow Hansen fella, he's a player too, eh? The Danish guys. I find it interesting in Europe is your your domestic players, the guys from the country where you're playing. If you have a core of good dudes that are players, that's when you win shit. The imports kind of can cancel each other out, right? Like you could, your group okay. imports can be a little bit better than the other teams, but they're not going to be that much better, right? It's when it's when line three and line three plays each other, or line four, line four plays each other. But like, even Bow Hansen, like he's he's he's, he's a like player, a player, right? Seven, two hundred and like forty five pound guy who can stick handle and shoot and knows the game. It's like in practice, I can't get the puck off of him. He just like he'll just put it out here. And I'm like reaching around him. He's so good at protecting the puck. Like he's just, he's a wagon. The big boys that know how to use their body can be effective. There's lots of big boys out there that don't know how to use their body. Right. Yeah, exactly. Perlini. He's a, a team GB guy, right? Yeah. He's on the, the British team. He's a super good guy. Really takes care of his body. Likes to, uh, you know, eat just, right and stuff. Yeah. He's a very, very health conscious him and his him and his wife are both like she's a trainer um you know they're you go over there and have food like it's always like good healthy stuff um fun fact for the folks is once you get in your shed years after playing hockey is those are the guys that are still playing (laughs) the guys that live like that (laughs) yeah he definitely uh he definitely has longevity um in his in his realm there because i mean he just you know he's he's a pro's pro so it's uh, it's pretty cool that uh, is cool. Um, well, you know, what's funny is um, I kind of got to go back to the real world, but um, like you guys playing Sundar Yuski, I find it interesting that I'm 
going to be rooting for you guys because I did win a gold helmet with Sundar Yuski, uh, but they did not ask me back. And um, your fans are having fun and throwing Twix on the ice and you and Mac are on the team, right? Chad guys. So sorry. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? Man? Bring your Twix, folks. It's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, hey, yeah, we're, we're open for it. First game on the road, second game at home. Well, and everybody, folks, don't forget to go to the Impactive website, right? And starting the 29th of November, that's Tuesday, folks, 15% off with the code SHEDBOOST, all one word, right? SHEDBOOST. <laughs> and that's fun. And fun is fun, right? It is fun. And this has been another episode of Zero Hills and Hockey Tales with Tanzer and Wally. <laughs>